Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome to this session uh, of uh, the second International Environmental Peacebuilding Conference. Uh, we'll be uh, discussing uh, in this second plenary of the conference the issue of environmental peacebuilding and sustainable development, the way forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am Achim Wenmann. I'm the Director for Strategic Partnerships of the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and I have been part of the organizing committee of this very conference. So it is my special honor and privilege uh, to be your moderator today. Um, we will perhaps just take a couple of minutes uh, to uh, welcome additional colleagues and, and friends uh, to the session. And I would just already like to emphasize uh, that this event is being uh, live, uh, live, um, live available also in uh, Spanish and French uh, for those who are joining us uh, from, uh, from these language areas. Um, and also, uh, please do not hesitate to interact uh, with the discussion uh, by sending uh, your questions and comments into the chat so that we can keep this session uh, as interactive and possible. And there is a dedicated slot also towards, uh, towards the, the, the third part of this event um, where we can uh, interact and, and of course focus on some of your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we have designed uh, this second plenary um, with the issue in mind that we want to have a high level policy uh, diplomacy interface on the issue of environmental peace building and sustainable development. Um, we thought this is particularly important uh, as both academic uh, research and also policy development does not take place outside of a political vacuum. And uh, hence the importance uh, of this second uh, conference to also make the bridge and provide a link uh, to the discussion on environmental peace building in academia and policy making, and also link it to the diplomatic sphere. In particular, of um, screening this event uh, with many participants from Geneva, of course, originally intended uh, to be held in Geneva at the Grady Institute at our premises in the Maison de la Paix. Uh, we place particularly emphasis of this bridge to the diplomatic and the, 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 the political world. Um, there is no better moment or more, no more, more significant moment to have this discussion, uh, because what comes out of uh, the political world of uh, negotiations in international Geneva is a view of the future of the world that uh, gives a lot of cause for concern. On the one hand, out of the peace and humanitarian communities, we are seeing an ever greater proliferation of complex emergencies. Uh, these proliferation or, and the, the greater intensity of turbulence and more violence and unmanaged transitions place both the humanitarian uh, and the political conflict management system um, at its, uh, at, at its, uh, at its uh, um, out of its, its uh, comfort zone, and also put many, many um, diplomatic services in a position of constant crisis mode, so that they are losing out of sight longer term reflections that are necessary to achieve sustainability, both in environmental and developmental terms. Then just next door to the Graduate Institute sits the office of the IPCC. And uh, of course here, with the impending release of the second working group report on impact adaptation and vulnerability in the face of climate change. Um, we have really an, a new framing for discussions about sustainable development and the role of environmental peace building to achieve it. Um, this report will set out a science base on the large scale and systemic impact of the social rupture and also the significant humanitarian crises that are on the rise um, based on the projections of climate change impact. Um, in other words, the voice of scientists has never been clearer about the significance of the challenges that uh, we have to deal with in politics and in policy making circles. Um, and you add to the mix uh, uh, geopolitical change 
technological innovation as well as global pandemics and you can you get a, even a greater sense of the significance of the challenge so this panel is not about fatalism it's not about putting the head in the sand and uh, and just let it all try to try to go ahead of you it is really the emphasis despite all of this what can we do what is the way forward um and of course with the opportunity of having this environmental peace building conference um we have a um a, 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 an incredible community of practice uh, that in the past has demonstrated a whole degree of of innovation um in terms of finding practical solutions about what can be done to uh, deal with this situation now of course we have a wonderful lineup uh, to uh, to take us through the challenges and the opportunities to deal with this uh, the, these these elements that i i just des described um we have um of course Elise grande the president and ceo of the united states institute of peace and we'll hear also later uh, from uh, ambassador johanna lacing pates uh, the ambassador for stockholm plus 50 as well as ambassador nazat shamim khan who's the permanent representative of Fiji to the United Nations and, and, and other international organizations in Geneva, and Katriona Gole, Executive Director of Peace Nexus. Um, the, the latter three panelists will, will speak later. But first, um, allow me to, to turn our attention and ultimately also to turn the screen to Lise Grande, um, who will be uh, our, who will offer, offer us keynote reflections on the theme uh, that we uh, that, that we are uh, discussing here, you know, environmental peace building and development the way forward. And one thing that is particularly important in these reflections is the reality check um, from people that have really seen the ground or the field, so to speak. And no one could be better placed than Lise, uh, because just in preparation of this, I looked, uh, I went through all the countries that she has been uh, that she has been posted to which include most recently, of course, Yemen, but also Iraq, South Sudan, Armenia, the DRC, Angola, East Timor, uh, the Palestinian territories, Tajikistan, Sudan, and Tahiti. So there is no one better placed uh, to, uh, to provide us with a reality check uh, on uh, environmental peace building and sustainable development. And uh, I would, with these words, please hand you the screen and we're looking forward uh, to your keynote re reflections. Please. Please allow me to start by thanking Akeem and all of the organizers for inviting the United States Institute of Peace to this second environmental peace building conference. I'd also like to start by paying my respects to the distinguished ambassadors and colleagues on this panel. I'm sure I join many people in welcoming the excellent white paper which is being released during this conference on the state of environmental peace building and which has been expertly drafted by the Geneva Peacebuilding Forum, Peace Nexus, EPA, EPI, and IUCN. In my brief comments this morning, this afternoon, I'd like to build on several of the important points raised in the white paper. First, I'd like to reflect on what we as environmental peace builders already do well, but also on the areas where we might want to invest more energy and more resources. Second, I'd like to reflect on our shared climate, environment, and conflict agenda. And third, on how we might want to advance our shared agenda within the multilateral and international system. In preparing for today's meeting, I had the opportunity to talk to a number of people inside the field of environmental peace building on the ground in institutes, in research, and academic institutions. Several things were very striking about these discussions. When I entered the field of conflict and diplomacy 25 years ago, environmental peace building was almost never discussed among practitioners. Now it's widely discussed. A second thing that's very striking is how much hope is attached to this field by practitioners. Hope that environmental peace builders can change the way we view conflict and hope that we can contribute to how peace building is done. The third striking thing is how diverse and diffused practitioner approaches to environmental peace building actually are. Starting with what we're good at, it's a long list. Environmental peace builders have helped to incorporate 
and increasingly forefront the role of the environment and environmental change in conflict prevention and resolution. Conflict analysis is better than it was before and practitioners and policymakers now have a much deeper and more nuanced understanding of climate risks. Environmental peace builders have also helped the field to broaden its lens by focusing on the strategies that communities adopt when they face these risks. This has opened new areas of peace building activity, including resource negotiations between belligerents and dialogues that bring communities together to build, manage, and protect green spaces. There is, however, an equally long list of areas where more investment is needed. I'd like to reflect on four, scale, accountability, diplomacy, and multilateral cooperation. At the top of our list of things to improve is the importance of ensuring that environmental peace building operates at the scale necessary to address the monumental challenges we face. A lot of what we do as practitioners on the ground is significant. It's entrepreneurial, it brings communities together to work on joint solutions, and it helps to break cycles of violence. But taken as a whole, a lot of what we do is still patchwork. It's often ad hoc, and we still lack the kind of broad impact we all aspire to have in preventing and resolving conflict. Also at the top of our improved list is accountability. This takes the form of ensuring that the countries and entities that have contributed the most to climate change do the most to address it. This includes following through on nationally determined contributions promised at the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. It includes establishing generous financing arrangements for new green technologies. It includes improved land management and adaptation and adhering to the principled framework for transboundary migration and establishing restitution mechanisms for future loss and damage. A third area we need to invest in is diplomacy. If you look at the total number of peace agreements that have been negotiated in the past 75 years, less than 15% mention natural resources. Not enough is being done to make the environment a focus during negotiations, nor to train mediators and frontline peace builders on environmental issues, nor to support and build the capacity of environmental delegations at peace talks. The fourth area we need to invest in is the multilateral system. As it stands now, the international institutions that deal with conflict and the international architecture for addressing climate change don't intersect. They are on two parallel tracks. Joining them at the right places at the right time could double, triple, maybe even quadruple their collective impact. Turning to my second point, already we can see the emergence of a shared climate environment and conflict agenda. Many of its components are well articulated in the white paper. I'm sure many others will be added during our discussions and panels at this conference. Our shared agenda benefits from the impressive research which is going on across the globe. It benefits from peace building institutions, organizations and networks which are contributing to the agenda by piloting, supporting and learning lessons from concrete initiatives on the ground. As we move forward as a field, sharpening and prioritizing our shared agenda will be invaluable for guiding our collective actions. We can use a shared agenda to hold ourselves accountable. We can use it in our advocacy with governments and the financial and private sectors. It may be too soon to expect a field as young as environmental peace building to have a really crisp prioritized agenda, but there are very pressing reasons for us to try to agree on one. If we look at conflict through an environmental lens, as Akeem said, there's a lot to worry about and at least two things to be very, very worried about. As we all know, mass global migration and widespread water scarcity will become the norm on this planet within 30 years. Already, as global temperatures rise and regions become unlivable, these phenomena are moving from being problems that some countries and some communities face to becoming the defining features of the 21st century. As many as 140 million, maybe even 200 million people may be on the move by mid-century. By that point, half the world's population is likely to be living in areas that the UN defines as water stressed. If I can just make one note, 
I was for many years within the United Nations, the only senior peacekeeping and humanitarian official that was in fact a water engineer, I'm a hydrologist. The second thing we need to be very worried about as peace builders is the likelihood that the shift to green economies already underway is going to be perilous in terms of potential conflict. We need to anticipate that regional, maybe major conflicts may erupt over access to the minerals and resources upon which these new green economies depend, as has happened this past century over oil. Within countries, and this goes right to the heart of what Akeem was talking about on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Disruptions are going to come as economies decarbonize, as new green elites and green losers emerge, as communities battle to monopolize the benefits of the green technologies, and as governments try to deal with social, economic, and political unrest. In some cases, the shift to green economies may help a country reach the sustainable development goals, but in many countries, in fact, it's likely to do the opposite. This brings me to my third point. If we care about peace, which we all do, we need to engage the existing multilateral system to push forward on a handful of key priorities. I've heard this described as pushing the big green conflict button. In the next 12 months, we have a lot of opportunities to take collective action on climate-induced conflict. In June, Stockholm Plus 50 will commemorate the 1972 United Nations Conference on the Environment and celebrate 50 years of global environmental action. In late February, we have the first ever Middle East and North Africa Climate Week. During February, the IPCC will present its report on mitigation climate change, the UN Conference on Desertification, and the UN Biodiversity Conference will start their meetings. The 15th World Forestry Congress starts meeting in early May, and the 11th World Urban Forum and UN Ocean Conference start meeting in early June. The IPCC presents its sixth assessment of climate change in early September, followed by the UN General Assembly in mid-September, followed by the UN Climate Change COP27 in Egypt in early November. On top of these opportunities, we have the chance to encourage the adoption of green COVID-19 recovery plans in the countries where we work. And with donors, we can advocate for more financing for these green recovery plans. During my preparations for this conference, when I was speaking with environmental practitioners and policymakers, I took the liberty of asking what priorities they wanted the international community to move fastest on. Here are the top five. First, advocate with governments across the globe to implement and uphold their responsibilities under the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, which is the first intergovernmentally negotiated agreement covering all dimensions of international migration in a holistic and comprehensive manner. We don't want this key framework which is essential for us managing the impact of climate change to languish or be pushed aside. Second, establish a special dedicated window in the UN's peacebuilding fund in the peacebuilding commission to channel monies to environmental peacebuilding organizations on the front lines. Third, provide mandatory training on environmental peacebuilding for UN peacekeepers and offer this training to UN and other mediators. Fourth, review and support the 10 or so major transboundary watershed frameworks that set parameters for the management and distribution of shared water resources in conflict prone areas. And fifth, encourage governments to assess the effectiveness of the institutions within their countries responsible for managing natural resources if these institutions are wanting encourage governments to take steps to quickly improve their effectiveness. I'd like to share two final caveats. The first is about the international system, which is under tremendous pressure. As the global balance of power shifts, many multilateral institutions are suffering from the loss of legitimacy and funding. 
At the same time, this system is expected to deal with a bewildering range of global problems, including mass migration, arms control for new nuclear and space-based weapon systems, cybersecurity, pandemics, global economic shocks, and the realities of a very unequal globe where two thirds of the world's most extreme poor live in settings characterized by fragility, conflict, and violence. Just when the international system to address climate-induced disruption through inclusive collective action and accountability is needed the most, it's not at all clear that the system can actually deliver, which raises the deeply uncomfortable question, if not this system, what then? Second caveat is about the possible risk of securitization of environmental action. As the authors of the white paper note, climate change is more and more recognized as a security issue. While this is true, it doesn't follow that we have to address it through securitized solutions. The track record of securitized approaches to social, economic, and political problems is not something we want to replicate in the field of environmental peace building. In conclusion, allow us to express our deep gratitude to the Environmental Peace Building Association and the Graduate Institute of International Development Studies in Geneva for convening us and to celebrate the Geneva Peace Building Platform, the Environmental Peace Building Association, the Environmental Law Institute, Peace Nexus Foundation, and the International Union for Conservation of Nature for guiding all of us through their exceptional white paper. Akeem, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, what a, um, thank you so much, Lise for setting out such an impressive analysis and, uh, and, and source for discussion as we now go into the panel. Particular what you mentioned on the importance of the, of the nexus, where so many different um, fields of policy and practice intersect, and also what, what uh, the colleague from USAID, uh, Rob Jenkins, mentioned yesterday, this need for integration. That is, I think, uh, an area of, of, uh, of, of challenge that many, many institutions are, are grappling with, particularly the, the real the practical, um, the practical advances on real integration in order to solve issues, complex issues on, on, on the ground. But also your, your highlighting of the multilateral system being um, at stretching point, at overstretching point. Um, that is surely something that I can attest to being at the heart of International Geneva uh, where many of the international organizations um, are, are experiencing this, this stress point. Now, these are, of course, a fantastic segue um, into, our, into the panel discussion, which we have now, and particularly the list of all these opportunities, all these moments uh, which we have uh, coming up of, in 2022, um, is tremendously important uh, to, to, in fact, have this collective footprint on the, how did you call it, the big green conflict button, um, in order to, to press that button and also shape the awareness about the importance of peace and peace building uh, in uh, the, the whole variety of environmental discussions in the multilateral level and also at national level, as you rightly point out. And I think uh, we have no one better to, to put this question to then Ambassador uh, Johanna uh, Lissinger Peitz, who is the Swedish ambassador for Stockholm Plus 50, uh, one, of the, one of the stops on the, on the big multilateral uh, calendar, which you have mentioned, Lise. And so, uh, Johanna, uh, let me uh, put the question to you about why it is important to put peace in the Stockholm Plus 50 conversation. I turn Thank the screen o over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Akim, and, and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, and thank you, Lisa, for your, your keynote speech. I think we all listened with, with great interest. And uh, I, was, I was kind of tempted to rewrite some of the things that I wanted to say uh, here and now. Um, if I would respond to with a one sentence, Akim, to your, your question, why is it important? Uh, I would maybe go to the headlines and names of the 1972 conference only one earth, uh, which I think gives a reason enough, but also the longer title for Stockholm Plus 50 uh, this year, which is a healthy planet for the prosperity of all, our responsibility, our opportunity. And uh, I think we can simply not achieve that if we are not connecting uh, the nexus between 
environment, climate, environment, peace building. Uh, so that would be my, my one sentence. I know that I have a little bit more time than that. So I'll try to also elude a little bit further. And um, I'll try to just give a little bit of a, of a framing on where we are, uh, give a few examples on how we see that these issues connect and then looking, looking ahead. And when we are looking at our planet today, there is simply no place on earth untouched by human influence. Uh, I think we all saw the research just uh, two weeks ago uh, where it's now also suggested that we have crossed the fifth planetary boundary on the pollution. Um, at the same time, we know that the national environment is a condition for human life. Uh, the Human Development Report in 2020 highlights that social and planetary imbalances are connecting and reinforce each other. And uh, this reinforcement is often stronger and with larger consequences for the most vulnerable, for those living in fragile states and conflict areas, and for those whose lifestyle has not been the major contribution, uh, contributor to breaking those planetary boundaries. So uh, in, in leading up to this conference, you, we also discussed, you know, what's, what's the role of the 2030 Agenda in, in, in all of this? And I think the 2030 Agenda, in a way, gives us the blueprint for action. Uh, but it's also very clear that we need to act with a greater recognition of responsibility. Uh, Ms. Lisa Grande spoke about accountability. I think that's a, a key issue. We need to show that we are implementing within the time frame we have agreed and also within the time frame that science is telling us that we have an opportunity to act. We also need to act with greater urgency. Uh, and we also need to act with greater sense of togetherness, where I think also this multilateral system and coming to approach. And knowing that we have um, Ambassador Khan here also, I know during the Fijian presidency, there was um, a strong message on further, faster, together. Um, and I think that is also very much uh, a key issue. Uh, and if we are not doing this, nature will also turn, I think, from being... Uh, benevolent to malevolent and we are not implementing with that sense of urgency and responsibility that we have. Um, so let me just make you know also a few reflections on, on how do we then operationalize this? What is it that we need to do? Uh, and this is I think just adding to the picture that was just giving us to us in the, in, in the keynote we just heard. Uh, I would maybe pick up on three different issues. Uh, the first, uh, knowledge base. We need to continue to build on the knowledge base, on the links between climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, environmental degradation, um, and doing so in a regional and international security in different geographical contexts, uh, and thus preventing the tension that this may result in between nations and in societies. The second point I would mention is... Um, avoiding new new silos, uh, or rather doing working forward through a holistic approach or a nexus issue. Uh, these are all words, very easy to say, very easy to agree on, but much more difficult to operationalize. Also because when, when we come in those nexus uh, issues, uh, sometimes we also end up in the discussion on, you know, who is the responsible actor to drive this issue forward. Uh, so I think for us to succeed, we also need to do more to, to breaking down the silos. And that's also why I think for Stockholm Plus 50, one of the keywords for us is implementation and interconnectivity. Interconnectivity in the sense of uh, connecting stakeholders. Uh, to get connecting different international uh, organizations, uh, but also different policy areas. Uh, and the third area I would probably mention is uh, that we take the responsibility to act upon the challenges, but that we also look at the opportunities and the opportunities for peace that may arise through our joint work to address climate change. Uh, so it's, it's something we need to do at the same time. Um, and of course, some of the example, uh, I think from, from Sweden, and I will not take all of them, but maybe just uh, the example of the UN climate security mechanism, which is really 
uh, there to be the UN coordinated uh, voice to help to coordinate within the UN system uh, and to educate people and to create that link in the local context. Um, and I think further work on, on connecting the experience from the on the ground level, from the local level to the governance issues uh, is a key in, in our way forward. Um, if I'm just looking ahead also on, on some um, moments during the year to come here, uh, I think for us, of course, and I know there are great cooperation uh, between the authors of the um, white paper presented here today um, and uh, Stockholm Forum on Peace and Development, which will also launch their environmental peace report uh, just weeks before Stockholm. So that's an opportunity also to, to so to say, influence the context and, uh, and the uh, issues of discussions uh, in June in, in Stockholm. Um, and I think also, as, as often argued, nature has, in a way, become um, an actor in international affairs. Uh, and this inserts new complexities, new uncertainties. Uh, it's leaving no individual or society exempted from nature's hand. Um, it also requires, I think, new competences. Um, and that we are also looking at our systems and governance structures and in institutional ways in a different way. Uh, and the cost and benefits for individual states when it comes to transitioning to a sustainable green economy varies. And I think Lisa Grande spoke about this too. And uh, in a different conversation, the other someone told me the other day that uh, we need to do more to actually connect the just with the transition. Uh, we are speaking about a just transition, but we are no, not always there in our actions in, in connecting the two. So I think finally, um, with regards to, to Stockholm, uh, taking place the 2nd and 3rd uh, of June <coughs> this year, uh, and which is also an event, of course, that we are co-hosting with uh, Kenya, uh, and where UNEP is our UN focal point. Uh, the themes are very broad. It's a meeting focusing on accelerating implementations of commitments. Uh, it is a broad theme. Uh, we will be working through a focus on three leadership dialogues, which again fits very much into our discussion here today, reflecting on the urgency of action for uh, a healthy planet for prosperity of all, inclusive and sustainable recovery and accelerated actions. This leaves and creates an opportunity, uh, an opportunity I think we need to a wide approach on discussions. And it's very often in those interconnecting dots and in the nexus where the solution lies, uh, a solution I think that is leaving no one behind and is also taking into consideration the most vulnerable. Uh, so I'll stop there and I'm very much looking forward to hear uh, other colleagues and distinguished panelists being speaking on this topic. Thank you, Achim. Thank you very much, Johanna. And uh, of course, the notion of uh, further, faster, together is something that I, I think brings together the entire community to such a new degree of, uh, of, of, of awareness, uh, be that what the scientists say about the need for acting fast, but also about the, the work, the important work uh, in politics to broker the alliances to be able um, to work to walk or act to go further, faster, and together. And this is, of course, at the heart of the diplomats' work in Geneva. You know? And this, of course, brings me to your work, Ambassador, um, Ambassador Nasad Shamam Khan. You are the ambassador of Fiji uh, to the uh, United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva. Um, you will also leave Geneva soon to become the, uh, the deputy chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. My uh, sincere congratulations for this appointment. And of course, in this town, you have been extremely well known for your role as the president of the Human Rights Council last year. So with, with this long years of diplomatic experience, um, further, faster together, um, what does this mean for a, a small island state like Fiji with respect to this discussion on environmental peace building and sustainable development we are having here? Ambassador, the screen is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction and what a pleasure it is to be here. And a particular pleasure to see 
Her Excellency Ambassador Johanna, we last met um, in the corridors of climate negotiations at COP23. Um, and if there's anything like a, a, a very, very high pressured environment, it must be a COP. Uh, so uh, really I have very, very good memories of how we work together to go further faster together. So it's, and it's a pleasure to see everyone. And of course, uh, these are the last few weeks uh, that I will be in Geneva. And I think Geneva has been at the center of so much work on climate change, on the relationship between climate change and the SDGs, and very importantly, the relationship between climate change and human rights. So I am privileged to speak today about some of those relationships and how they affect small island developing states. Because as you know, uh, Fiji is a small island developing state. And uh, when we opened our mission in Geneva, it was with a very clear agenda to ensure that all the multilateral work that took place in Geneva would have relevance to Fiji, to the Pacific, and to small island developing states generally. So it is a pleasure to be here to participate in this conference on environmental peace building, because I consider that much of our discussions have a lot of rev relevance to the work that we do on the ground in countries like Fiji uh, and in the Pacific region. And I want to thank everyone who organized this event um, and um, encouraged getting together to exchange views on the focus on environmental peace building. So let me talk about sustainable development what it means uh, for small island states, and particularly what it means in the context of climate change. We all know that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development recognizes that climate change undermines sustainable development. We know this, goal 13 is very clear, and it is dedicated specifically to climate action. So we know potentially that climate change can undermine every country's progress when it comes to development. But it is very, very important to differentiate development from sustainable development. If we are to develop sustainably and not just because we want to encourage investment willy-nilly, for instance, irrespective of the harm it may do to the environment, if development is to be sustainable, then inevitably we must consider the integration of climate change with what development means in human rights language. And this I think is really important because there has been so much discussion on what development means in the context of human rights. And uh, I think very importantly, these are conversations that we've had in the Human Rights Council. I have been very proud to be part of those discussions. And very importantly, we see how climate change affects not just economic, social and cultural rights, not just the right to water and sanitation, the right to uh, education, the right to culture, but very, very importantly, in the way in which countries approach, approach climate change, the fact that you have disruption of systems might affect civil and political rights as well. So very importantly, that we see sustainable development in the context of a rights-based language, and we recognize that Activity that is a result, a direct result of climate change, and for instance, internal displacement as a result of disasters would be a classic example. We see how these events have an immediate impact on people's rights. Basic rights, the right to water, the right to sanitation, but also the right to participate in decisions which affect them. And so I think this conversation that we are having today about sustainable development, climate change, and environmental peace building is not just a conversation about the substance of what climate change does, for instance, to the GDP of a country. It's also about changing the processes, the institutions that approach these discussions to ensure that they're inclusive and participatory and respective of civil and political rights as well. And that's why any discussion on sustainable development goals, any discussion on climate change and environmental degradation must be as much about changing institutions and the way we talk to each other on the ground in our countries as it is about, for instance, our NCDs and how we're going to reduce emissions. So in my opinion, institutions in Geneva, such as the Human Rights Council, 
have really seen how these concepts integrate with each other and how a discussion about the environment necessarily means also a discussion about rights and the SDGs. And one example of how that's worked here in Geneva, the Human Rights Council, has been the way in which the special procedures mandate holders have articulated the way in which climate change has affected adversely the rights that they have particular interests in. And particularly the way in which climate change affects vulnerable population and how climate change affects development goals. And I, I feel very proud about this because it shows that the mandate holders and this whole procedure, the special procedures model is able to be flexible with uh, the urgent requirements of our time. And for an as an example, the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty in 2019 published a report on the grave impact of climate change on the human rights of those who are living in extreme poverty. And in that report, the Special Rapporteur said, and I quote, climate change threatens the future of human rights and risks undoing the last 50 years of progress in development, global health and poverty reduction. And then concludes that climate change is amongst other things, an unconscionable assault on the poor. And I think these sorts of powerful findings by the experts who report back to the council have really helped to shape the work of the council in relation, relation to the environment. 30 years ago, there was very little discussion on the relationship between development, climate change and rights. But in the course of only the last 12 months in the Human Rights Council, we have seen two resolutions, recognizing firstly, that the right to a safe, sustainable and healthy environment is a human right. And secondly, that uh, there must be a mandate on climate change and human rights. And the fact that sustainable development is woven into those conversations, I think is absolutely crucial. So then looking specifically at how that conversation here in Geneva, that kind of integration is affecting the work that we do on the ground. In other words, when we have a cyclone in Fiji, is it making any difference at all to the people on the ground that we are having integrated conversations in, in Geneva? And I think it's very important to again emphasize that this conversation is as much about process as it is about substance. So it's not just about ensuring that everyone is safe after a cyclone. It's also about ensuring that when we design responses to cyclones, tsunamis, volcanoes, that we have an inclusive process which puts at the table those very people who are going to be the most impacted by these disasters. In other words, if you don't empower people in this process, and empower those who are likely to be the most adversely affected, then the systems that we set up are unlikely to effectively respond to their requirements and their needs. If you don't have persons with disabilities at the table, for instance, when you're talking about the building of evacuation centers in a cyclone, then when the cyclone happens, persons with disabilities will be the most adversely affected. The same with women, the same with children, and knowing, for instance, that in a, a disaster, there is a higher likelihood, and we know this now from the work of the International Red Cross, there is a higher likelihood of sexual and gender-based violence, then we must have women at the table designing the processes which help to guard against that in a crisis. So this means understanding how development and participatory models will contribute to addressing both civil and political rights, as well as economic, social, and cultural rights. And we do this in a process that empowers people. So we're looking at development that is sustainable because it builds societies which are fairer, more resilient, and built on human dignity and equality. And we're talking here about a transformative process. We know that not all our societies have been inclusive. We know that all our societies have not consulted the most vulnerable when designing processes for development and for responding to climate change and disasters. So when we change the way we participate, then we are transforming our societies and we're working towards a democratic way of responding uh, to these crises. And that is as much part of sustainable development 
as ensuring that we have enough money. So to me, the word sustainable in the word sustainable development in the context of the environment means setting up institutions and strengthening institutions which are participatory and which are built to last not just through this hurricane, but the next 10 years of hurricanes. And in this sense, the work that's been done as a result of the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction has been quite transformative because the Sendai framework recognized the need to put people at the table, to redesign and to respond and to build resilient societies. And, and also recognized that when you set up systems to prepare for disasters before they happen, then you are building a more resilient society, which as a result will ensure that our development is sustainable. We know that every time we have a crisis, there is a direct impact on the GDP of every country, which is impacted, we know this. So we must minimize that risk and minimize that harm. And the way to do that is having participatory process to anticipate the harm and to anticipate the harm done to those who are adversely and disproportionately affected by climate change and disasters. So this is the point I make. We're talking here about transformation. This is not business as usual. Sustainable development, if it is to last and it is to truly be a journey for every small island developing state, must take into account the fact that we have to change the way we speak to people. We are currently in a health emergency. And if there's one thing we've learned from COVID-19 is that again, it cannot be business as usual. And secondly, that COVID-19, like every other crisis, has exacerbated existing inequalities and has shown in the harsh light of day what inequalities and discrimination exist in our societies. Why it is not, not everybody has an equal access to vaccines, for instance. If we respond to this pandemic and we proceed to develop our countries in relation to this crisis, and try to go back to the way we were, then I'm afraid that kind of development is not sustainable. So it's really about lessons learned and also understanding that this pandemic, every disaster, every hurricane, that this provides us with a moment of reckoning that we're in this together and that we are just as strong as our weakest point. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of developing capacities to build resilience against future shocks and to better developing economies, governments, social services, and infrastructures. I come from a small Pacific Island country. I know how challenging it is to develop this kind of infrastructure, to protect the rights to housing, for instance, to water and to sanitation. And I now know how important it is to integrate discussions about the two sets of rights. But for those living in poverty, they don't want to get into a very academic discussion about whether this is a civil or political right or whether this is a social, economic and cultural right. As far as they're concerned, there is no water in the tap. There is no house for them to live in. And they're forced to live in a place far away from the village where they lived and their ancestors lived because of the rising sea levels. So they don't have time for an academic discussion. What they do have time for is transformative systems on the ground. And if there's one thing we've learned in the work at the Human Rights Council and in organizations like the Platform for Disaster Displacement, that is that projects which work on the ground with people and are aimed to recognize the intersection of rights, the way they work together, together with the implementation of the SDGs, these are the projects that will work because they understand and build on the experiences that we have had as communities in small island states. And in this sense, I again mention the Human Rights Council and its mechanisms. And I feel that the fact that it is actively engaged in promoting this intersection of different rights, as well as with sustainable development, I think this is going to be key to the way that individual countries um, implement both rights and development in the future. So let me then come to an end to say that in my opinion, no development is possible without sustainable peace. There is a very close relationship, a close nexus between conflict, human rights violations and insecurity. And that for small island developing states, we see this unfold whenever we have a crisis because it brings to the surface uh, all of the difficulties that we have 
in ensuring uh, that all voices are held and that our infrastructure and our institutions work in a way that empower people and help them in times of crisis. So having said all of that in the traditional way of Fiji, I thank you, Vinaka Bakle, over to you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Khan, and particularly by emphasizing the importance of participatory models, since this is, a, a, of course, the, the DNA of what peace builders do and how they work. And hence also there the, the, the tremendous interlinkage between uh, those who are engaging on transformation from a human rights lens and those who are engaging on transformation through a peace building lens. Um, and there is, I think, three decades now of tremendous experiences of, of making participatory models work in some of the most inhospitable contexts around the world. So there is a lot to, to draw on, and particularly in a place like Geneva, where, where sometimes all this capacity sits very close to each other, but doesn't necessarily speak sufficiently with each other. No, and this is exactly where we, as the Gratitude Institute and a lot of the platforms, are of course positioned to facilitate these, these discussions. Also, I think, thank you so much for highlighting the transformative component no, and, and building, building it on the input and the experience of people, because ultimately the scale uh, of the challenges and the frequency of the challenges are so broad that top-down centralized processes are literally practically unlikely to work. Um, and uh, that is, I think, also something that, uh, that comes out of the analysis of uh, how one deals with systemic challenges uh, that are multiple and, uh, and, and frequent. So thank you so much for, for your reflections. And um, I think we, uh, we, I just want to take a brief moment to take stock before coming to Catriona. Uh, on a couple of themes which are coming out uh, of the discussion. The, the issue on scale and speed uh, with respect to the needed response, the, the need for uh, uh, the connection between the, the policy spaces, the policy discussions, and what is necessary to be done uh, in specific contexts uh, for people. As Ambassador Khan just mentioned, when the, the situations where people are concerned about water not coming out of the tap and, and needing to grapple uh, with the impacts of climate change on, the, on a daily basis. There is also the issue of building processes and of, or simply responding to specific crises. This longer term process work via very short term crisis response and that tension between it, the tension between participatory models and centralized approaches in the response um, as well as of course the, the issue of longer term transformation. Katriona, I know you, you'll be able to speak to all of this, and, uh, but we can, we can possibly zoom in on, on one specific one. Katriona, uh, thank you for making time. You are, of course, the executive director of the Peace Nexus Foundation, uh, just close to Geneva uh, and uh, along the lake. And one thing, given also Peace Nexus's work uh, in, on peace building, integrating so many uh, across different policy areas, Perhaps one element of the long list that I've, I've just pulled up might be particularly interesting for you to look at, which is this notion of uh, integrating actions across different communities that are really operating in distinct silos. And there, of course, peace, you have your own personal experience, but also Peace Nexus has dedicated a lot of work in this field. So, Katriona, the screen is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you to co-organizing also the white po paper process, or at least initiating that process of which we were honored to be part of, as well as inviting me to this conference and, and session. So, um, so a short answer as to why I'm here is perhaps because we supported the white paper process. Um, and I want to start by just congratulating um, the, the steering committee for a collaborative process. I think that that white paper and particularly the compendium of 50 articles that go went behind it show the diversity of actors and contributors and, and really lay the groundwork for showing the, the breadth of the field um, and take the sort of first steps to showing you know, what is a common 
direction that this field can go in. Um, not to say that there is a single, as um, was put, crisply defined, uh, you know, call for action, but there, there, there is a broad coherence in the agenda. And so I, um, I congratulate everybody that was part of it for for coming up with that, that result, which is the beginning rather than the end of a conversation. But as a second reason to why I maybe you alluded to um, Peace Nexus's work and and the the integration question, um, so the mission of our foundation is to strengthen peace building um, effectiveness, but by organizational strengthening. Like, what does it mean to strengthen operations and um, and and be effective on peace building challenges? And what I'd like to say is the majority of our partners that we work with are not organizations that would call themselves peace building organizations. They are organizations that work in humanitarian sector, migration, development at the local level and at the regional level, and more recently, um, in conservation and environmental issues. So the, the reason why we work together is, is it's born out of necessity. If you're working on environmental issues or development issues, conflict is you're at the front lines of conflict in many cases. And so our partners realize that in order to achieve their primary objective, which may be to do with migration or displaced persons or, or conservation, they need to be able to have the capacity to deal with um, you know, transform opportunities that are conflictual into um, opportunities for cooperation within their programs. So, so this integrated response challenge, I think one place to start is within your organization. So um, if you are working within a, um, uh, a an organization that is hasn't got peace building somehow in its mandate, um, I think any everybody has a role to play in building the capacities to do that. And usually it takes a few things. You need leadership to say, this is part of our mandate. We are going to have a policy framework or a strategy even that accepts that dealing with conflict is part of our work. But then you need to have a core set of champions through the organizations, usually in a unit or some resources dedicated to building that capacity. And then it's a long process of changing and adapting your programming. It can There can be integrated programming with clear peace building objectives as well as conservation or development objectives, or you can do both side by side and link them, or you can partner with others that do them. But all of these things uh, are part of transforming your own organization to be more um, integrated. Similarly, on the other side of things, if you um, if you're working for a peace building organization, I am amazed at how often kind of environment blind peace building organizations are when they come to doing their conflict analysis. They're only looking at groups and relative power within groups, but not at the broader environmental context and the longer term trends. So I think building environmental awareness into the DNA of peace building organizations is also a place to start if you're working for peace building organizations. And we've already heard this morning about, or this afternoon, um, about how different kinds of conflict actors have begun to do this. So whether it's the UN's peace peacekeeping operations, at least coming up with guidance not to do environmental harm, or more peacemaking actors considering building their capacity to work on environmental issues within peace agreements, or and political settlements, or um, what we see in our local actors where the state is, or the legal system is not that strong. You have many civil society organizations. For example, in West Africa, we work with um, uh, associations of pastoralists or nomadic pastoralists or with um, smallholders. They are building in conflict um, resolution mechanisms within their core mandates because that is just necessary and they and there is nobody else to do it at that time and so in with multi partial mechanisms they are reducing conflict linked to transhumans and in situations under stress for example and finally i see that peace building movements are also joining together particularly youth movements with environmental movements to strengthen their coalition in a, in the way that climate activists and social justice activists are also coming together in some places. There is a broader alliance, for example, there's a united network of young peace builders that's linking with uh, 
more environmental work or even the women's international league for peace and freemen they have freedom it's a big network they also have environmental parts of the network so i think that this broader coalition building is something we see and is important so that's if you're in an organization and i just want to say another accelerator of that integration is obviously from the funding side and I, you, you can see, I, re, I recall that Lise Granda mentioned the UN Peacebuilding Fund earlier on, but you can see when the UN adop, adopts a narrative of sustaining peace that covers a much broader agenda, and they have a funding instrument, the Peacebuilding Fund, which is relatively new, it's amazing how UN Environmental Program, the, the, the migration agencies, the development agents, they, they are all much more ready then to, to integrate peace building within um, their programs because it is part of this broader narrative and there are potentially resources there. But I would follow uh, Lise Grandi's recommendation that the one area that's least developed in that area is the environmental peace building area. So there is room for that too. But on the flip side, I say that there is relatively little funding that goes into peace building compared to the environment. And what we also hear is that the challenges from conservation organizations or environmental organizations to build in peace building into their funding applications that are primarily to do with conservation classic um, uh, programming. And so this, this need for greater flexibility amongst funders, whether they're coming from whichever sector, would definitely accelerate that integration. And, and finally, um, to, to the point of this conference and to this white paper process and the actual, the, the other part of building more collaborative ecosystems, Obviously, um, as many people know, this, this needs support in itself. So I, I congratulate the, the, the very inclusive process. And I also congratulate one of the first recommendations to come out of the white paper, which is very self-aware and self-reflective, to say that this environmental peace building community is, is, is a, a shadow of what it could be. It's, it's not yet as diverse and inclusive as it could be. And this process just shows that huge potential. So one of my take homes, if you're part of this community and sitting in this conference, join, become a member of the Environmental Peace Building Association, engage actively, learn from others in this community, because I think without that foundation of peer learning, and community or spaces for collaboration like that, we, we cannot get to the next step, which is this more, um, uh, well, a stronger evidence base, the knowledge step, but also the CRISPR um, asks to, at the policy level, at the international level, and even at the national level. So we need to be in a habit and, and invest in these spaces for learning and cross cross-disciplinary exchange. So um, once again, I, I, if you haven't read it yet, I encourage you to read the white paper, but particularly also the background um, papers that contributed to it. And as a final shout out to the amazing artists that have are inspirational in, in, uh, in, in this conference and, and also in, in the white paper. Uh, so to all those that had a much bigger role in this process than I did, thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. Thank you very much, Katriona. And I, I just like to, to, to pinpoint an important element which you said, which is this, this growing alliance building among youth movements. I think this is a, a, a very important moment that very frequently goes unrecognized in, uh, in the diplomatic world or in diplomatic capitals, that there is a lot going on in many places. Uh, and that uh, young people are actively rethinking and reconceptualizing the world in which they want to live in. And uh, with the global connectivity which exists, uh, alliance building has never been easier. Um, and we see this from uh, in all sorts of fields. And this is, I think, really a, one of this, this unrecognized coming force um, for pushing forward on the speed and also on the scale. Um, because there is a very different level of energy um, in this space, uh, which I think requires uh, more direct and deliberate attention to be recognized as one engages in these discussions about how to confront uh, these tremendous challenges which we're facing. So that I think is very important. Now, um, 
Lise, hold your horses, please, for the moment. I want to get you back in, please, to reflect on what, what you've heard, but just hold your horses for the moment, uh, because I want to bring in Gabriel. Gabriel Gomez, who has, uh, who has been a staunch uh, facilitator in crafting, uh, not just this session, uh, but also has been a, a staunch um, a helper on, on bringing the contributing to the organization of the entire conference. And Gabriel, you've been watching the chat. And uh, why can't you, can, I would like you to share a few reflections of what you got out of the chat and also in view of um, pinpointing some additional reflections to Lise, what she might take out in some reflections that are coming out of the chat. So, G Gabriel, what, what did our audience say? Hello, good, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone watching us. Thank you very, very much for all of you for, for being here, even though we are not able to, to join together in, in Geneva, doing it virtually is, 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 is amazing as well. Uh, I'll just present some of the very interesting discussions that are going on uh, right now in, in the chat, which is quite active. And first and foremost, we have a very interesting question coming up from, from Nina Tumaini from Kenya. Uh, and she's asking how to effectively address protracted crisis that continue to unfold despite international engagement. So are there more sustainable solutions? Because if, even though international organizations uh, are engaged in some of those crises, they keep unfolding. And uh, Frank Cabrera also highlighted uh, the importance of including indigenous communities and learning from the traditional knowledge. And we know that Fiji uh, is an amazing case study on how, how to successfully accomplish that. So maybe later on, we could just do a second round during the Q&A session and uh, get Ambassador Khan back in, back in and uh, just give us some, some, some insights about that. So these are essentially some of the, the important discussions that are going on right now. And also for, for Lee's, it's important to address how this protracted crisis keep going on and how to put a definite end on them. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for hi highlighting uh, some issues. So, Liz, um, getting back to you, uh, we heard we heard a lot of a lot of elements. We have now added an, another uh, one, particularly how to how to deal with this constant flow of newly emerging conflict and crisis, despite all the existing systems which which are there. Um, and then, of course, indigenous voices, indigenous communities, which will be a, a question that I will bring back to Ambassador Khan, of course, but. Liz, also the issue of you emphasize the scale, but you didn't say anything about speed. Um, so perhaps some reflections on this, this I'd like to, to point to you and any other reflection you would like to share after uh, hearing our panelists speak. I can thank you. And it was very interesting listening to the ambassadors and Catriona reflect on, on these questions and then Gabriel's intervention as well. Um, if I could um, talk about the, the opportunity that we have to move this diplomatic agenda within the existing diplomatic architecture, recognizing that that's a flawed architecture, that it has its own internal logic, its own internal pacing, knowing all of those, I think there is still a clear responsibility for us as environmental peace builders to get moving and start engaging with the system in a way that allows it to use its assets and resources to help address the, the problems that were identified. Um, to do that, if I may, the clearer we are about what we want, the higher the chances that we're gonna succeed in getting somewhere. So I think one of the, the, the problems that we face as environmental peace builders is um, a, a very, um, basic, but quite existential question. What exactly do we expect from the international system? And if we can articulate that, if we actually know what we expect it to do, it then is a um, more straightforward um, uh, effort to engage that system to get what we want. What I've noticed is that you know, we were asking all kinds of things and it's not necessarily a uh, clear to many of our interlocutors, what exactly do we want? Now, you know, some of the, the, the very important comments that have come up today have to do with um, preventing conflict related to the environment. 
that may be where we as a community really settle. And we say of all the things that we're facing, the thing we care the most about that we absolutely have to get right are a series of prevention strategies that are gonna have impact because there's gonna be a lot of conflict whether it's a conflict over an actual resource or it's a conflict over a resource that's necessary for the economy or a shared public good like water, we're gonna have these conflicts. And we may as environmental peace builders say, our role in the next 20 years is to really focus on strategies we know are gonna prevent and then program those strategies, get money, advocate for them and build capacity around them. I think one of the, the more uncomfortable realities of our group is that we have a long list of things we care about. We say, this is all important. We have a very complicated way of approaching it. Lots of practices and processes. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying we don't need those, but there are a lot of them. And you know, this goes to the point that you asked me, why didn't I talk about speed? There was a reason I didn't talk about speed. All right, and the reason is because if you really wanna work at speed, then many of those processes become rewired. Some of them get sequenced into a later date. Some of them get sequenced out. That's the reality of speed. I didn't even touch it. Because where this group of people is now, where our community is now, is very focused on those processes. And I just didn't feel that, I, you know, that's an important place to be in. I think we need to think about that. But when we start really talking about speed, that's going to influence the way in which we approach alliance building, inclusivity, participation. Every one of those words is hours, days, years of investment in process and process and process. And not necessarily an investment in scale and speed. And I just didn't think that we were ready for that dilemma yet, but you forced the question, so I've answered it. Can I say something about- Sure, um, sure. Please, please. Having spent a long time on a lot of these, um, uh, platforms within the multilateral system. I really want to come to this point about prioritization. Um, the more diffuse and unclear it is what we're asking for, the less impact we're going to have. All right. And that's why I, I think of all the points we've raised, that's one, if we really are serious about engaging in the multilateral system, we may not be, we may decide that's not the way this field should go. But if that is where we go, this is the issue we've got to come to grips with the fastest and first. Thank you, Liz, for, for this. But I have a follow-on question to you. There. You notice that I went off camera. <laughs> I, I did, but there's no, you, you can't hide yet. There is a very Geneva type question I'm going to put you, which has to do with private diplomacy. Yeah. No? All of these kind of good offices, informal yeah. engagement, this kind of network of six to 800 informal mediators that get things done. Yeah. Now, um, a lot of prevention is being done that way. That's right. And a lot of engagement is being done but without anyone knowing. So, right. of course, Geneva is a capital kind of of this globally, uh, also due to the history of, uh, of that type of practice uh, for in Switzerland and, and, uh, and particular Geneva. Now, is private diplomacy a potential way to speed up, even though we are not getting into, into, into a German motorway? Yeah. No? Yeah. Um, just to, to get obstacles out of the way through private diplomacy. Great um, question. And, you know... It, it, it's a, it's a wonderful question or a wonderful way to formulate it. So one of the things that I didn't say in my comments when I was talking about, you know, I, I, I really tried to prepare as best I could for our conversation today by talking to a lot of people. You know what's really striking about mediators? They almost never mention environmental issues. Akeem, you and I were talking in preparation for this as well. Remember when we were speaking a couple of weeks ago and I said, look, you know, if you're actually out there on the ground trying to negotiate with rubble, this never comes up. 
yeah, I did 12 wars, never came. Doesn't come up with mediators. You know, which raises the, the question about how do we get them to engage with it? And, and this is why I talked about mandatory training for peacekeepers and offer the training to mediators, both within the UN system and other, you know, the OSCE, the EEAS, you know, there are a lot of mediators out there. And I think one of the fastest ways that we could harness all of the networking that you're describing on through good office functions and special envoy functions is some very smart training. You know, we, we, I, many of us will remember the, the really long um, heroic struggle to make the right to protection, R2P, a key feature of the international's commitment to mitigating violence and protecting civilians. And you know, it really, it's, it, 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 part of why it succeeded was it, this was precisely the pathway for it. You had a whole group of special envoys, representatives and mediators who started to talk about the responsibility to protect before it was seized by the General Assembly or the Security Council. And you know, that was a pathway that in that issue worked Miraculously, I mean, if there was one thing, you would never think that the United Nations, you know, built on the bedrock principle of sovereignty, would adopt as the responsibility to protect, and it did. And I think part of it was because this issue moved from the margin through networks and special representatives right to the center of the global architecture. And maybe something, I think if I'm interpreting well your suggestion, this may be something we think about on these issues. It worked before, it may work here. Lots more to think about, but uh, before we think all of this further, I did want to come back to also to Ambassador Khan. Um, there was an, a question on uh, indigenous communities. So um, if I might, might just hand the screen briefly back to you, Ambassador Khan. Um, the, from the Amazon to, to, uh, to, uh, to small island states, this is a very, very, very important group. And particularly, of course, a group uh, that should be part of the very inclusion which you have mentioned in your speech. Have you any specific examples um, of, the, of the, the role that indigenous communities have played in your work? in particular with the role, uh, of course, on the, on the issue of climate change and human rights. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, because indigenous communities have such a close relationship with the environment um, and indigenous communities are in such a good position to understand what is happening to the environment, that to exclude them from discussions at a national level or regional level would be, I think, a fatal flaw in planning for the future and for developing uh, for the future. And, you know, if coral is dying or the fish are dying, because for instance, there is a large structure being built along the shoreline, then it's the indigenous communities who will first tell you that this is happening and that this is going to have an enormous effect on the environment. For small countries, the environment means marketing their um, tourism because for many small island countries, people come and visit our countries because of the environment. So protecting the environment is not just about respecting the environment for its own sake. It's also a very wise decision for the future for this country. So excluding the indigenous from these discussions would be a terrible uh, mistake. And of course, in my country, as uh, one of the participants has quite correctly pointed out in the chat, uh, in my country, not over 90% of our land is held in trust for indigenous communities. And that means that there is already a very close nexus between the views of the indigenous and the land that they own. They are the traditional owners of the land and that land cannot be alienated by sale. It can only be leased or rented. So that's, uh, you know, in, in principle, a very good thing. But actually, when, for instance, the sea levels are rising, then it's indigenous land that is impacted the first. And when you are displacing large communities, then the current legal framework of Fiji or for any other country has never really taken that into account as to how we are to consult the indigenous in deciding on the movement of people. And in this sense, uh, working with the international community and in particular, looking at the international UN guidelines on internal displacement 
has really helped Fiji to formulate policies and regulations for Fiji, which ensure that there is at all times consultation with the indigenous communities on the ground, which are the ones which are the most impacted. So for instance, no community in Fiji can be moved to higher ground without the consent of the community. And that brings in another aspect of this conversation. With whom are we speaking when we talk to the indigenous? Because in many indigenous cultures, uh, the head of the indigenous community is a male elder. And if you want to guard against moving whole communities to higher ground um, and uh, having an adverse impact on the women of that community, you really want to make sure you've spoken to the women and the children if you're moving the school. So then uh, Fiji has had to redraft rules of consultation to ensure that when you're talking to ind indigenous communities, you're talking to those who have been traditionally left behind and whose voices may not have been heard. And in this, and I noticed another question on the chat, and that is about the role of legislative frameworks. And in this, I think you really can't avoid uh, legislation. In order to really map out how you are speaking to people, I think it's very important to have policies and laws which ensure that governments comply with this kind of um, uh, inclusive participatory decision-making. And I can give one example of how that has worked in Fiji. There are endangered species uh, in Fiji, particularly amongst the fish. And of course, fish is a very, very valuable resource for Fiji and for all Pacific Island countries. So there is a law now in Fiji to do with marine spaces, which ensures that the heads of traditional communities are able to decide what can be fished for in particular months of the year and what is, what is forbidden. So it empowers the existing indigenous communities in an area that they already are the best knowers, if you like, they already know their environment so well and ensures that there is a legislative framework which empowers them and which gives them a legislative strength and backing. And uh, that's a very good model because it marries the law with indigenous knowledge and with the need to protect the environment. So, and the second of course, is the fact that we, we now have internal displacement guidelines in Fiji, which ensure that no community gets moved without informed consent and that they have every say into where they want to go, what they want to see when they get there and the level of cultural autonomy they are uh, able to ask for. And of course, it's government's job to enable this entire process. I hope that's helpful. Over to you. Thank you for emphasizing the free prior and informed consent rule, which is, I think, at the heart of so much um, um, need for humanity as a starting point, because it, it, if it doesn't happen, it, it really it is an absence of, of humanity, particularly with the, when you are moved or you have to go and unsettle everything. So thank you very much for, for, for pointing this out. Ladies and gentlemen, we are, we're coming to, uh, to the end uh, of our, our session. And as a moderator, I'm particularly pleased that I don't have to pull it all together. Um, we have uh, Ken Conker here, um, from the, who is professor at the School of International Service at Un American University, and also Annika Erickson Pearson, who's the head of community management at the Geneva Peacebuilding Platform, who will do just the work for, for me and for, for us at all, because here I think we've heard a lot of actionable points that uh, come out of the session. Harkening back to the point I mentioned at the very beginning, we, we, sh we can't just put our head in the, in the sand or, or uh, be fatalistic about this, this entire change which is coming, but be actionable, uh, but, but be proactive about grappling with the challenges in front of us. So Ken, um, could I start with you? Um, and could you share your reflections on actionable points that you draw from the discussions that we just had? Certainly, uh, thank you, Occam. And thanks to the panelists and the organizers. It, it, it's really a privilege to be part of this uh, distinguished group. Let me just say as someone who's been present as a researcher from the earliest days of this field, as I listen, I'm struck by how far we have come. Uh, and not simply from the vantage point of Stockholm 50 years ago, or even the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, but even for Rio plus 20, 
uh, a panel asking how environmental peace building can contribute to sustainable development wouldn't have occurred e even a decade ago. And so that reminds me of the, the newness of our field, uh, but also some of the momentum behind our field. And I think it's important to capture that. I think there's a lot of important insights and ideas in this very rich discussion. Um, as I've been listening, I've been asking myself, uh, again, as a researcher and as someone who's been present really from the earliest days in this field, how it can be of use. And I think there were three themes that really stood out for me across the remarks and trying to do a little bit of synthesizing. Um, the first is the question of scale. And I think here a bit of historical perspective is important. Much of the earliest work in the field of environmental peace building had pretty broad ambitions of scale. A lot of work on international river basins, regional seas, broadly regional transboundary conservation initiatives. In many ways, this was a field that was born at the international scale rather than at the localized scale where so much of the grounded work is occurring today. Um, and since then, uh, and in no way to disparage the localized work, which is vitally important, uh, I think we've had a tendency to retreat into a bit more localized focus. And in some ways, maybe we're victims of our own success as donors have gotten more interested in programming. Uh, as the UN Environment Program started doing its really seminal and important uh, grounded assessments in war-torn societies emerging from conflict, as intergovernmental organizations got more interested, I think researchers have been drawn to those agendas. And so I think the first synthesizing theme that I would underscore in this conversation is I'm hearing a challenge for us as a community of practice and a community of research to recapture that initial instinct to work at broader scales. Uh, and I think Lee's is a fascinating proposal about the idea of doing a sort of a comparative assessment of the state of important international water accords would be an example of the sort of work that this community could very much, uh, very much contribute to. A second integrating theme that I heard as people were speaking is the idea that the transition that we seek itself is laden uh, with conflict risks that are going to have to be managed. Um, here I would underscore Ambassador Khan's point about the importance of rice-based approaches, uh, and also Lise Grande's observation that climate change resilience and adaptation, uh, while vital, are themselves laden with conflict uh, potential. I, I do think there's a growing aware awareness of this when it comes to talk about a green economy shift. Uh, people are starting to recognize that some of the land use implications of large scale solar, some of the mining and minerals implications of, of, of the technological needs um, are, are, are sensitive and, 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 and controversial and contentious and laden with conflict potential. And I'd give a shout out for people to a panel later today in this conference on the idea of how to diagnose and prevent a green resource curse, which I think will engage those issues quite uh, in quite an interesting manner. As someone who works in water, this is evident. If you ask me how we'll be managing water 30, 40 years from now, we'll be recycling more water, quite obviously. We'll have to store more water to even out the seasonal imbalances. And we'll have to make room for water as we design our landscapes as a flood resilience response. Um, those transitions are laden with conflict potential because they redistribute where who has access to water. They redistribute what is considered to be a livable and a viable space. They define who has to move to make room uh, for the river. And so here I really want to underscore Ambassador Khan's points about rights-based approaches. The Sustainable Development Goals, quite frankly, were not written with as much of a rights-based emphasis as they could have been. And so I think a challenge to our field as one that focuses on dialogue as one that focuses on stakeholders and giving voice uh, to people's concerns. I think there's a role for us to play in making sure that the full range of voices gets heard around the conflict potential in the sustainability transition. And the final theme that I will flag just briefly is the idea of bridge building. Uh, Ambassador Pites talking about the importance of acting together uh, and breaking down silos. Ambassador Khan talking about bringing in the work that's going on on the ground. Uh, Katrina Gourlay's observation about the silos between environmental practitioners and peace practitioners. I was involved the last cycle of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the attempt by Working Group 2 to produce a chapter on human security. And it was a telling experience. And what I observed in that experience was the intersection 
of a science-driven climate modeling way of understanding the problems around human security, really rooted in science and the peer-reviewed literature, with a much broader uh, and, and more heterogeneous set of ways of knowing rooted not just in the social sciences, but also in many practitioner-based forms of knowledge. That was a very difficult and challenging conversation. And some of the most important ways of knowing about these issues were unable to find their seat at the table, I would say, uh, in that process. And I think we learned a lot from it. So we have to work on that communications interface. And it seems to me that environmental peace building as a field that emphasizes trust as a field that emphasizes dialogue, as a field that emphasizes confidence building, um, has a lot of practical and grounded experience uh, about ways to be uh, the bridge that we need. And so I'll stop there and I'll simply say that I hope that some of these ideas that this panel has seeded will infuse our discussions over the next few days in this conference, but also our agendas as researchers and as a community of practice uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, and particularly for emphasizing that tension between the sciences and the social sciences in, uh, in, uh, in and this multi, multi-dimensional ways of making sense of reality um, between the, these communities. That's uh, surely something that I would like to, to speak much longer on. We have no time for that right now, but we still have Annika here, who, who will also share uh, the, her, her reflections on this panel. Annika, I think after day two, um, of the Environmental Peacebuilding Associations Conference uh, needs no longer an introduction. You are, of course, the head of community management uh, with the Geneva Peacebuilding Platform and the heart, soul, and connectedness behind the white paper. So, uh, Annika, again, great congratulations to you and, of course, Oli Brown and other authors for pulling the white paper together. Um, in the face of all this, was there anything new in this session? Well, gosh, thank you, Achim. And I know this is a bit dangerous to be time to be speaking as we're officially over time. So I appreciate all of you sticking around for a few minutes. Um, it really is a privilege to be here and I have to say quite inspiring. Thank you to all of the esteemed speakers and guests for your interventions. I am feeling motivated as usual. Um, so as Achim mentioned, I work at the intersection of environment, climate, conflict, and peace, and have been asked to share also a little bit of my ideas on sort of where, where we go from here, where, where are we going, um, and, and connecting that to today's conversation. And a big piece that stands out to me from today is this exact policy diplomacy interface that the, the event tried to address. It's clear that we as a community need to continue to develop and build our relationships with policymakers. Rob Jenkins said it yesterday in the opening very clearly, don't give up on us. <laughs> um, but in fact, collaboration and including between policymakers from researchers, practitioners, has come up now as one of the core challenges and limitations in different panels or breakouts that I've attended at the conference just in the last day. Uh, there was a panel on, on mainstreaming environment, climate, or environment conflict and peace just prior to this plenary, with one of the main recommendations coming out of it being, again, an investment into these connection points between our various fields and with policy, and, and it came up uh, numerous times in the panel here or in the plenary here today. So that's kind of what I want to zero in on. Um, I call back to Ambassador Khan's comment. Mo many individuals don't have time for economic, uh, sorry, many individuals don't have time for academic discussions. They have time for transform uh, transformational systems on the ground. So for now, kind of <laughs> what do we do with this, right? I think we have to continue to harness the best of what we have to offer. Who plays to their strengths within politics and diplomacy? Who plays to their strengths within these academic discussions? Who plays to their strengths within practice? How do we build momentum as we try to foster these more inclusive, um, more inclusive dialogue as Katrina mentioned? Is it possible to maybe have these conversations like the one we have here today in other languages even? Um, it's really clear that we have a rich ecosystem of actors. Um, we saw that in the conversation here today and that we each have sort of an essential role to play. And the key as I see it as a community builder, right, is investing time and staff and, and resources and, and energy into that how of collaboration. 
So I was given kind of five minutes to talk here. I'm already two minutes into my time and I could dig into the, the laundry list of examples from today's plenary or of events and, and meetings that we have to have together. But I may actually follow Katrina's lead on, on getting very practical and, and just wanna spend a minute talking about the how. Um, Inter-institutional collaboration, inter-silo collaboration, inter-sort of actor type collaboration is just really tough. Um, integrating what we know is really tough. Um, we heard that also from Lise Grande today, uh, this, this challenge of prioritization. We, our, our field goes in so many directions. So I have three points for us to think about when it comes to how we collaborate. First is time investment. Um, how are we working in or creating time to connect and exchange with others? Is collaboration institutionalized within your job description? Should it be? Could it be? Time resources are also clearly linked to financial resources, which came up again and again today, and we need to be considering them both. A second uh, to consider is uh, for collaboration is the idea of inclusion, which came up many times in many ways today. Uh, are we being intentional about who we connect with? Um, are we investing money to pay for interpreters to allow us to connect across languages? I think one of the poignant takeaways I have from the Global Youth Summit on Conservation from the IUCN last spring was this resounding refrain from the participants saying, English is not the language of conservation. So how can we continue to build this and this, this decolonization into the very systems of the way that we work? And finally, uh, the last point on, on collaboration and the how um, is, is to get better with facilitation and community building. And I'm biased because this is my job. Um, but how can we build a community sense that's so strong that people are incentivized to overcome temporal, financial, linguistic, et cetera, barriers and actually want to connect with each other? I've been astounded to see you know, 40, 50, 60, over 100 people on Zoom rooms all day today, connecting with each other two years into a pandemic. That's a community sense that we've built. So we need to continue to invest in, in that community building. And I think the white paper on the future of environmental peace building was in some senses an experiment and facilitation. Uh, and, and I just say, I hope that all of you can find your sort of places within that project, own them and then jointly move forward. I know I'm, I'm at my time limit here, um, so I'll just close on this. Um, since we all seem to agree that collaboration is necessary, and that kind of came to me as one of the main takeaways of, of today's plenary, let's just make sure we're making the necessary investments to bring it to life. Let's make sure that we're building communities that include policymakers so we can strategize together about shared challenges. And let's continue to invest in collaboration just like this conference. I look forward to seeing many of you on Zoom in the months to come, or perhaps even in person in Stockholm in June. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. And uh, you mentioned the importance of time in making connections. And I have abused your time, all of your time, uh, from the speakers to the participants. Um, and going uh, just about 10 minutes uh, over time in this session, which I can only legitimize by recognizing the tremendous wealth of reflection and experience that this panel brought together. So my wholehearted thanks goes to uh, Katriona, to uh, Ambassador Khan, to Ambassador Lising Peitz, and of course, Lise, to you uh, for uh, sharing your reflections and also to, uh, to all of you who participated actively um, in, the, uh, in the chat. And of course, Annika, uh, Ken, and also Gabriel. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, about halfway in the in the second International Environmental Peacebuilding Conference. There is much more coming on, and um, I just want to join in the recognition, something that Ken mentioned just uh, to uh, at the end, that we have really uh, we see we really see an incredible evolution of the environmental peacebuilding community, but also we are seeing an incredible. Um, evolution of the, the space in which it works. So I think there is a lot in the, in the stimulus that we received here uh, from, from very, very senior policymakers in the challenge forward and the way ahead of how we can connect to some of these multilateral processes 
in view of getting the most out. And hence the, 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 the point that I want to emphasize, the issue of prioritization, joining forces tactically and targetedly on issues where one really can make uh, um, uh, uh, an, in, an inroad in these very complex multilateral areas. With these words, uh, my thanks, my final thanks go to the interpreters who have helped to connect us uh, in one way or the other. And of course, also the technical team behind this seamless Zoom session that made it all possible. So um, thank you very much. Goodbye, au revoir, adios. Uh,